everyone and welcome. Today's challenge is going to be the first part of a men's 1920s suit, the vest or waistcoat. Depends on which term you use, they seem to use both during the time. I'm giving myself a little bit of a challenge with this particular suit in the fact that I am making it for me and I am not really the ideal or standard men's figure for the 1920s. That's not to say that I can't adapt this to fit me. I'm just making sure that I'm adapting it in a way that stays true to the proportions and the cut and the fit and the style of this particular type of garment, rather than taking it and either altering my body to fit the ideal or altering the garment's style and fit so much that it ends up being more like a modern women's suit with lots of curves and over-accentuation of the feminine figure. So I'm making sure in this case that I am still making a men's suit, it's just going to fit me. That presents a few challenges, and that is something that we are going to cover fairly in depth. I'm going to start off by drafting the vest, and then we'll get into the mock-up and fitting it and making alterations to the pattern and then the actual assembly of the garment. But as always, we need to start our exploration with a little bit of research. It benefits me slightly in the fact that men's suits in the 1920s are actually surprisingly curvy. They have a lot of wonderful soft curves into the waist and over the hips. They don't have the over-accentuated shoulders that you start to see developing in 1930s menswear. The trousers are a fairly slim style, the coat and waistcoat both mirror that, and there are many different options when it comes to all three pieces in the suit in terms of styling. For the waistcoats, I can go with a plain one, with a shawl collar, with a peaked lapel, or so many different styles, different numbers of buttons, different types of pockets. There's a whole variety of options. What I decided to do in order to simplify this slightly for myself was to first look at drafting manuals of the 1920s. I sort of zeroed in at the earlier 1920s. That tends to be what I really like in women's wear. And I really liked the overall curves that I was finding in men's wear during that time period too. So I first started looking at those tailoring manuals from around the same time. One of the ones that I found that was incredibly helpful to me actually is a serial magazine that came out twice a year called The Progressive Tailor. And in this, it has all sorts of advertisements and articles aimed at tailors for the time period. It shows some of the more fashionable new styles, how the silhouettes are done, or how you compare up certain cuffs and collars and lapels and things like that, so that way they're well suited to the current fashions. And they also have a few drafting instructions in there as well. And I really liked the styles that they put forward because they seem to be very youthful and fashion forward. And I really liked that about them. In fact, about a year ago, I actually did a test looking at a bunch of different 1920s men's suit drafting manuals, testing out different coat patterns, trouser patterns, and vest patterns. I didn't actually make any of them up. I just drafted them all out according to my measurements and then looked at how they varied. And some of them, like I said, came out a little more straight, a little more conservative. Some of them came out a little more curvy and a little more fashionable. And this was one of the series that trended more fashionable. So I decided to pull all of my elements from that series. I also really like the way that they explain how to do the drafting. Sometimes the drafting manuals can get a little murky and this one seemed very clear to me at least. May not necessarily be clear to everybody, but it made sense to me. So I decided to go with that. And fortunately, because they also have all of those fashion plates and with them, it kind of helps me decide what sort of styles I wanted to go with. I am going to be using a really nice tweed fabric. So I wanted to make sure that the style sort of fit with the fabric as well. And I know this is a fabric that is fairly common and popular during that time period, in no small part due to the fact that I actually have a giant book full of tailor swatches from around this time period and I can see lots of different fabric options that were very common. This is one of them as a beautiful fabric that I got from the historical fabric store. So that's what I'm going to be using. That helped me decide which vest I wanted to go with and subsequently all the other elements that will come in future videos. 
And for this, I decided to go with the vest that has a lapel that's full in the back. It doesn't have a full collar that goes around the back. The lapel is peaked and ends at the shoulders, and it's not a style that I've done before. So it presented me with a little bit of a challenge, which I like. And of course, this all gives me the opportunity to show you how I'm not only dealing with the drafting and the fitting, but also the actual construction of the belted pockets and the interfacing structural layers and just all of the really nice tailored finishes that you can add to these pieces. The first thing I do with any drafting pattern is decide what the measurements need to be and I go ahead and do the math for every single step. It just makes the process go so much faster when I'm actually trying to draw these things out than trying to figure out what 1 8th of 27 is. Pretty much every single type of draft, you're gonna be starting with laying out a grid that starts with your back. And from there, it's proportions in terms of length, which generally patterns have you measure that. Occasionally they will use your chest measurement as a proportion for that. I generally ignore them when they tell me to do that and instead actually measure my back and my front in terms of length because I think that's pretty important. I will always measure that out so that way I'm sure the chest and waist and hips and all of those things end up at the right height for me. The system of proportions is commonly used within Taylor's drafting. And it's something that you have to be pretty aware of with trying to adjust these patterns to fit less typical body shapes. In the case of my body shape adjustments for this waistcoat, I didn't do any drastic changes. The only thing that I did is that I will actually have two different chest measurements that I use. One of which is my actual full bust measurement. And that makes sure that I make the actual vest large enough for me. However, when it comes to proportions of where to place the armholes, how wide the back needs to be, and how wide the shoulders need to be, and all of those measurements, I find that I do better figuring out what my proportion would be without some of my uh, extra bust. What I generally will do is go and look at the ideal proportions that are considered typical for men with my size of waist. What size of chest do they have? In my case, I have a 38 inch bust. A typical chest for a man with my waist size is 36. It's not a huge difference, but that can set the proportion of where the side seam is and where the armholes are just a little bit differently. I need more circumference in just that front piece. It doesn't need to be in the back to accommodate my bust. So I make sure to go look at what the typical proportion is and essentially use two different measurements depending on what I'm actually doing with that measurement you might find that the difference between the two is fairly extreme, in which case it's really hard to say exactly what proportion you should choose between the two. A lot of it will just take trying it out, testing these things, and gradually you will get to know what standard chest proportion works for you if you hold your weight in a slightly disproportionate way to what they expect. One of the reasons why I specifically chose this vest pattern over some of the others is that it is meant to have a dart in the front. This is something that will be able to allow for so much adjustment in fitting around my bust. So that is something that I found incredibly important when choosing that style. Now I could put a dart in other styles, but I like the fact that this told me exactly where it needed to be. So starting with the waistcoat, there are a few adjustments that I typically have to make with these just because of my shape of figure. The first is almost always that there's a gap here along the neckline. Now, a little bit of this will be actually drawn in on the tailored piece. However, this is a lot more than I want to deal with. So the easiest place to take it out is right up here. Now, it seems like it's a weird place to put a dart, but we're not actually going to put a dart there in the final thing we're going to essentially move the shoulder over. So if you find that you have a lot of gapping over here, not down here, but over here or in the neckline, which is more typical, we're going to go ahead and essentially fold up what that excess is and try and aim it across there. So that should take care of this angle being correct. We'll deal with whatever's happening over here next because I have some gap right there. And this is where it's a little more complicated. If you're fitting modern women's stuff, you can put a dart there. You can take it out by putting a dart over here. But essentially that's really hard 
for us to do in a menswear style vest. What I'm going to start off by doing is figuring out where the radial point is. So essentially where your bust point is. And fortunately for me, there's this little dart here that I have a choice on. So it's aiming up to about right there, which is a good place for taking out this excess right there. So what we're going to essentially do is rotate that extra dart down so that way that's nice and flat. We'll redraw the opening there just so it's a little bit less of a deep cut and we will essentially radiate that once we've loosened it from the side over to here and make that dart bigger. Now I know it's kind of complicated and weird but I'll show you on the pattern and it will make a lot more sense. <laughs> All I'm going to do is mark with a pin exactly how much extra I have and where it is located and what angle it's at. So that tells me that's as much as I would like to remove. And honestly, where the um, underarm hits then is perfectly fine. So I will keep that in mind as we go to make adjustments. Once we've done that, we can work on the rest of the bagginess that is occurring with, the, with this vest. I'm probably going to want to take it in somewhat around the waist especially, but until I fix that front issue, I don't know where I can pull from or how much I can adjust. It might be that I want to really adjust this front line because if I pull right here and angle this more, that fixes a lot of the problems, but it also draws my side seam pretty far forward. So it might be that I want to take more out of the back than out of the front, but I don't want to make massive adjustments to it when I'm going to be completely remaking those front pieces anyway. So we're going to start with those and then we will come back to this. The first adjustment that I'm going to account for is adjusting along the neckline. I'm marking on the pattern how far I really need it to be taken in, essentially figuring out what length that neckline actually needs to be, essentially marking out the dart. I'm doing the same thing for the arm side, marking out that dart, and the point of that dart will match up where the actual dart in the vest is going to be. I then go ahead and open up these sections so that way I can overlap them and tape them so I can take out that extra space. This does mean that I end up with a bit of a skewed front neckline. That's something that we will redraw, which is not too difficult to do, but it gives me where my shoulder needs to sit because it's less a matter of actually adjusting the entire pattern. It's more a fact that my shoulders don't sit as far out as this pattern expects them to. So we're essentially bringing these shoulders closer into the neck and changing the angle of that portion. So changing the angle of where the front neckline is or the fold for the lapel is, is not a problem at all. Just need to straighten that out, redraw the lapel so that way it still proportionally works and doesn't have any strange angles in it, and try a second mock-up. Take two on the vest. There are definitely improvements, but we still have other areas that I can work on. To start with, this is now nice and flat along here, so that's not an issue. However, I'm finding that it's a little higher up in terms of where it fastens than I want it to be, so that's an easy adjustment for me just to change the angle of that and bring the point where it actually meets down just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. The shoulder area here is fitting much better. I don't have major gapping here. I have a little bit, but that's enough that I can move my arms and not have it cut in, so that's okay. It doesn't need to be super tight. It is still just overall way too big, and these darts are a lot bigger than I want them to be. They're also kind of angling a little bit differently for that reason. So, next step I'm going to go ahead and do, because I'm finding that the back is overall just a little bit bigger. It brings it too far forward in terms of where the side seams are when I pull it forward. So I'm going to go ahead and overlap a little bit more. So I'm going to take the fronts as they are and just move them half an inch back. I've got plenty of space the whole way down. So we're going to start with that and see how much that tightens things up and how much more adjustment I can do from there. We've adjusted the neckline down just about half an inch. I think that looks much better. I'll adjust where the lapel needs to be as well next. When it comes to the fit, I went ahead on this side and just simply moved the front back half an inch over the back. Didn't change the front at all, just changed where it overlapped on the back, and that definitely helps. However, I wanted to see if I could reduce the dart. So on this side, I not only adjusted 
towards the back, but I also adjusted the angle of the front and took that out of the dart. And I think that actually looks better, in my opinion at least. It seems to be a little bit less of a uh, extreme dart shape there. So that's what I'm going to go with. This allows me to get that dart down to a much more reasonable less than one inch at the biggest point, rather than closer to like two inches almost. First I went ahead and took out half an inch along that back side seam, and then we are redrawing that neckline so it buttons a little bit lower. It means I'll have to redraw that lapel slightly, but it's not a huge difference. I didn't have an issue with the width of the lapel or where it sat in terms of the appearance, so it's just sort of cleaning it up a bit to make sure that I like the angles that I had. From there we simply need to unfold the lapel, essentially. I do this by working across that straight line that is the neckline fold and just mirroring it up so that way I end up with the same lapel that I've been drawing on my pattern but mirrored over the fold line so that way it's actually cut correctly. I also had decided to redraw that side seam so that way the dart is less extreme. It does sort of negate some of the work that I did to get rid of the excess in the arm side, but it shouldn't be too drastic of a change. I felt like it was more important to get the body fit right than to make sure that I had absolutely no gapping in the arm side area. The first step, of course, is dealing with the darts, and then we can get into the pockets. We're going to be doing three welted pockets on this particular style of vest. They're single welts, meaning that they only have the one welt showing rather than both the top and bottom welt. Go ahead and start by stitching on the little rectangular piece that is the welt on the bottom and the longer piece of pocketing on the top. Then we open up the pocket. We do go through the dart here, which is not a problem to go ahead and cut that open. Just need to make sure that when we get to the end, we go ahead and cut a V into the end, so that way we can turn all of the pocketings through. We're going to start off by dealing with that welt. We want to make sure that it's nice and crisp and clean, so we're going to need to put a little bit of interfacing in it. I tend to work with a linen canvas for most of my tailoring. It's a nice weight. It's not too heavy, but it's very stiff, but it's not difficult to work with. It's pretty easy to find in different weights, and it's just really ideal for so many different parts of the garment. So you'll see me pretty much using exclusively this sort of linen throughout the vest. Once we've basted that little piece of canvas into place on the welt, we're going to then attach the shorter piece of pocketing to the welt itself, press that open, and then that will fold down into place. If you're concerned about trying to figure out what length of pocketing you're dealing with for both the top and the bottom, it's fine. Just cut your pieces extra big. It's just pocketing. And then you can actually stitch them together and cut them to the appropriate size and shape once you've stitched everything into place. So we've gone ahead and moved the welt back to the outside and pulled all of the pocketing to the inside. Lots of basting during every single one of these steps because it is so much easier to stitch basting threads in there than it is to deal with a whole bunch of sharp pins. So this is the point where I'm actually stitching the two pieces of pocketing together. You might notice that mine's actually been a little bit uneven and I end up fixing that in the end. To secure the welt and the pocketing that is attached to that, I just simply stitch in the ditch. You can do this by machine or by hand. By hand, I tend to do a spaced back stitch. And this will just keep the welt from rolling or the anything weight-wise you put in the pocket from pulling down and distorting your welt. The ends are then stitched with a little bit of a felling stitch at the very edges. And then I like to go along and do a spaced back stitch, just about an eighth of an inch from the edge. So that way I am extra sure that that welt is nice and secure, especially since I'm going to be putting my hands in and out of these pockets or objects in and out of these pockets. And I don't want to end up ripping or pulling or distorting the wool in that area. When it comes to your canvas, you don't need to have it cover the entire front body. It needs to obviously go into the lapels, but it doesn't need to go entirely into the side seams. 
If you do want to have it cover your entire front body, you will need to cut the dart and overlap that. But since I'm only covering part of the front body, I don't need to account for the dart because it's pretty much out of the way. I do, however, need to account for the fact that this lapel is going to be folded back. So I actually cut my canvas with a little bit of extra in the lapel area, knowing that it's going to roll over and essentially shorten. So I go ahead and base down along that fold line, but I wait until I can roll it back to pin and baste where the canvas lapel actually needs to sit. At that point, I can actually then trim back whatever extra is still left, double checking with the markings on the front piece. You want to make sure that you get as close to those edges as possible, or honestly, even a hair under is fine. We're going to be dealing with Taylor's tape for the next few parts, and that will help fix it if your cut is not precisely perfect for that layer of canvas. The first thing you need to do with your Taylor's tape, which is not twill tape by the way, Taylor's tape is plain woven so it doesn't stretch, but we're going to be running the tape across that fold line, and we're going to be pulling it just a little bit tighter than the actual garment, so that way it keeps it nice and taut and holds it in where we were talking about having gap issues earlier. And all you're simply doing is felling down both sides going through all of the layers because it's underneath the fold. You're not going to be able to see it on the exterior of the garment because the lapel will hide it. And that helps make sure that that part which is cut on the bias doesn't stretch and doesn't gap. Then we are able to start attaching the facing. This will end up with the same issues as the canvas did when it comes to folding over on lapels. So we're going to go ahead and pin it down and baste it down without dealing with that lapel section. For that, if you're doing it entirely by hand and you're folding back the edges and you're able to actually put wrong sides together, you can end up rolling it over and pinning it that way. But we're doing right side to right side so that way I can machine stitch this, meaning that I need to account for the extra rollover space without being able to actually see what that is. So I cut some extra in my facing and I'm sort of just pushing it back in a little bit. I want just a little bit of extra fullness, not a lot, but just a little bit. The facing will actually get tacked down later so it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. I just want to make sure that there is enough extra there. I'm then going around and machine stitching right up against that canvas, making sure to follow the precise lines that I have basted into my vest to make sure that I end up with the right shape. Then we're gonna take that Taylor's tape and go around all of those front edges. We're going to make sure that they don't stretch. We don't need to pull them extra tight in this case. We need to keep it even with the actual tension of the fabric, but this helps to create a very, very clean fold back line and make sure that your canvas is caught into place because the tailor's tape is stitched directly to the vest on the exterior side, right against where that machine stitched line just happened. And the other side of the tailor's tape gets fell down to just the canvas. So that way the canvas is now incredibly secure around all of the different edges. It's not going to move. It's a little scary clipping into the lapel. I must admit, I haven't done this particular style of lapel before where you need the sharp point, but you don't have a separate collar to create it. So it kind of unnerved me slightly, but it actually turned out really well in no small part due to the tailor's tape in that area, because that means that I can't cut any further. I can't accidentally rip it open or end up with tension problems there. Once the tailor's tape is in place, you fold back the seam allowance and whip that down to just the canvas, not going through to the body of the fabric. You'll need to do a similar thing to the arm side where the canvas is by trimming back that seam allowance if it's over a quarter of an inch, folding it back and whipping it down to the canvas. You don't put tailor's tape in the armhole area because you actually want some flexibility there. That's also why this is one of the areas that I will hand stitch when it comes to the vest rather than machine stitch. Hand stitching has a little bit more flexibility. The next step is to then start putting in the lining, which is again, hand stitched in so that way you can have a little bit of extra wiggle room. It's not super tight and you don't wanna end up with your lining overall too small. So it's better to do this top stitched by hand because then you're sure that it's absolutely precisely the right size.
The back is fairly simple assembly, and I attach the fronts to the back by lining up the shoulder and side seams. I've already gone ahead and stitched the two backs together down at the base. And essentially all I'm going to do is fold them up so that way the fronts are sandwiched in between the two backs and I can stitch around all but one of the edges then. You have to leave one of these side seams open to be able to turn it right side out. And I do this by way of stitching that one side seam to just the exterior part of the lining and leaving the interior part separate, but stitching through all of the layers around the arm size, the shoulders, the neckline, and back down that other side. So all I'm going to have to do is have one small side seam to hand stitch up in the end. Mm -hmm. 